Our first speaker will be Catherine Carlotto. She is a 2003 UMass Dartmouth alumni with a bachelor's degree in art history and a bachelor of fine arts degree in illustration. She is currently pursuing a master's degree in art history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst where she is majoring in modern architecture and minoring in medieval studies. Her interests include media studies, early cinema, German culture, and 20th century architecture. She eventually hopes to pursue a PhD in a related field. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth and the members of the Art History Club for having me here today. It's great to be back to see so many familiar faces. Um, today I'd like to speak to you about my research on the current state of the public domain and the future of technology within institutionalized spaces. Okay, we're good. Uh, so Walter Benjamin's unfinished research on the emerging forms of 20th century architecture entitled the Arcades Project discusses that architecture in its basic principle acts as a shell or a covering for its inhabitants. Like fashion, architecture presents an artificial humanity wherein its appearance remains in constant flux with societal demands. Thus, like any other commodity, its materiality is destined to become outdated. The cyclical nature of uh, material construction, deconstruction, and reconstruction leaves the future of ex existing architectural forms dependent on their ability to adapt. In the past, this type of transition was only accomplished through the use of tangible building materials, and for the most part, it will have to remain so for years to come. However, it has become increasingly apparent that technology has asserted itself within both architecture and fashion as the new vogue, adding a virtual element to the solidity of the human experience. Whereas this jump into hyperspace, so to speak, has exaggerated and perhaps discontinued the distinctions between virtual interfaces and the physical architecture of our built environment, this technology has also allowed for a rediscovery, reinterpretation, and re reintroduction of outdated public spaces back into the popular culture as functioning extensions of our society. Specifically, the public buildings constructed in the United States between the later 19th century and early 20th centuries have become less frequented spaces as the classically inspired marble and stone facades appear outdated, leaving little room for renovation without damaging or distorting their historic appeal. Even more disheartening, the public domain has now become a term synonymous with the world wide web. The infinite storage space of the internet has replaced some of the most basic functions of the library, museum, and university. And in terms of their outer appearance, their whitewashed, monumental facades have become archaic and sleek in relation to the sleek, lightweight smartphones and laptops that hold thousands of times the amount of information of an institution. Laying out these oppositions between uh, preserving the traditional and adapting the technological seems somewhat, somewhat paradoxical. That has led us to question the foundational importance of the public of popular architecture and the unique qualities it continues to maintain that are worth preserving. The following paper investigates the continuing importance of the public institution, analyzing the origins, current conditions, and predictions of the selection of a few modern buildings and the developing relationship they have between space and modern technology. So the emergence of the American public institution originated around the time of the First World's Fair in America during the mid, or in uh, London, England during the mid 19th century. These large functioning exhibition spaces, such as Joseph Paxson's Crystal, Crystal Palace of uh, 1851, displayed international technologies, inventions, and consumer products within one coherent yet uh, temporary space. This collaboration between technology and architecture within a public setting would trickle into the American capitalist ventures during the later half of the century, influencing young and aspiring American architects. However, their selection of building materials was to remain largely classical in origin. Instead of embracing the ephemeral qualities of the new materials of glass and iron, American architects returned to marble and stone. This in turn aided the public's trust in the stability of big business and strengthened the uni unity and patriotism of a country still recovering from civil war. The 1893 Columbian World Exhibition, also known as the White City in Chicago, Illinois, became the first attempt to express the monumentality of American capitalism within a Hausmannian-inspired um, Hausmannian layout. 
Whereas the exhibition was a temporary facade of non-traditional building materials, the response to the exhibition was followed by an increasing need to build in the style of what would be known as the American Renaissance. The time period following the Columbian Exhibition produced a variety of public buildings constructed in a similar Beaux-Arts style, coined the, uh, uh, coined the City Beautiful Movement. Public spaces such as transportation services, parks, libraries, universities, and museums were constructed in an effort to promote public accessibility and spatial organization. The liberation of knowledge and its integration into the public sphere uh, through a grandizing classically inspired architecture sparked quite a debate between the progressive city builders and the traditionalists of the American upper class. The bourgeoisie questioned the future of classical architecture in the hands of the working class in areas such as Boston, New York, and Chicago, places such as the Boston Public Library, uh, seeing this intermingling of class types as a threat to the preservation of American culture. However, it seems that well into the 20th century, the public institution has prevailed and created an integrated, classless, and equal environment for individual growth and academic exploration. However, within the last few decades, the increasing popularity of technology and the rapid expansion and availability of the internet has flipped many institutional spaces on their heads. Sources say that in the past decade, visits to libraries and museums have drastically declined. Cultural field trips in general have been restricted due to a shift in school funding, which has recently emphasized a curriculum based upon standardized testing. Moreover, those with internet access can now freely pursue the online databases of digitized books, articles, artworks, and more recently, virtual tours within museums and early architectural spaces. It would be safe to say, or predict rather, that within the next decade, museum and library databases will be completely digitized. So then, what becomes of the institution? Is there enough reason to redevelop its public appeal? In order to save its reputation, one must find the qualities and individualize these spaces as experiences unlike any digital form or database. Similar to how, similarly, similar, similarly to how Clement Greenberg described the survival of modern art in the 60s, the survival of the public institution depends upon its own medium specificity. It can be assumed then that the institution's future is dependent upon its origin, original form and function. Deduced to two specific operations, the foundation of the public institution is reliant upon its ability to utilize its physical interior space and to publicly educate. Two local Massachusetts examples currently in the process of modernization may hold clues to how we can recontextualize these buildings in a technologically based public domain. So the first example is the Springfield Library, um, commissioned by Andrew Carnegie in the early 20th century through the City Beautiful Movement. Um, it was constructed by American architect Edward L. Tilton um, and established a public admission-free learning environment for book enthusiasts regardless of their social status. Since its completion in 1912, the library has undergone multiple renovations to keep the institution's technology up to date. The installation of a children's room, a community center, computer technology, and standard utilities such as electricity, elevators, heat, air conditioning, and more recently, handicap accommodations have helped keep this building up to date with the city's codes and regulations. And yet, when visiting the building, one is instantly struck by the scarcity of its visitors. In analyzing the interior updates, it was evident that instead of working with uh, technology to create a more appealing environment, the library began to work for technology, adapting in a very limited way to contemporary needs. Inserting computers and in installing up-to-date utilities does very little to reinstate the original aura of what a library once was, a domain and experience dedicated to public education. It has become apparent that the survival of the library is dependent upon its ability to adapt to digital technology without losing its original appeal as a public space. Unless the Springfield Library is able to assert its individuality with a refined modern, within a refined modern context, it is destined to fossilize into a historic space, becoming a tomb or reliquary for the remnants of material knowledge. Overall, the building represents how technological updates can upset the balance between a building's functionality and its public appeal. On the other hand, a more successful example of the late 19th century, uh, of a late 19th century building that has adapted technology and retained public interest is a building adjacent to the Springfield Library. A part of the Springfield Quadrangle, an area in the center of Springfield that consists of a number of art and science museums, the George Walter Vincent Smith Art Museum, long name, <laughs> was originally founded in 1896 by decorative art collector uh, George and his wife Belle Townsley Smith. 
The building houses their personal collection of Victorian decorative arts, as well as a wide variety of 19th century Chinese, Japanese, Middle Eastern, and American paintings and sculptures. The building during the early uh, 2000s was renovated to preserve the interior architectural design and update utilities such as introducing air conditioning and light fixtures. Springfield Museum's president, Holly Smith Bove, commented that the renovation's ultimate goal was, quote, to have the museum not look like every other modern museum. Rather, the challenge was to make it exciting and relevant to 21st century audiences while preserving its distinctive original character and respecting the ideals on which it was founded. So over the past few years, the curators of the George Vincent Museum have creatively found ways to appeal to their 21st century audiences with unique exhibitions that synthesize the original collection with, a present, day, with present day technology. By doing so, the museum appeals to the contemporary culture of the public while simultaneously drawing an interest to their static 19th century collection. For example, in 2014, the curators of the exhibit produced a steampunk inspired exhibition entitled Steampunk Springfield, Reimagining an Industrial City, uh, using multi-sensory installations such as performances, contemporary art, costume contests, technology-based sculptures, and more. The exhibition helped to synthesize the George Vincent collection with a contemporary, within contemporary pop culture. Bogue's earlier description of the museum's renovation must have echoed down the empty hallways of the Springfield Library. It would be my wish to see the Springfield Library emulate the positive transformation of the George Vincent Museum if it is to remain a contemporary and frequented public institution. So uh, these two examples, yeah, that's the right slide. <laughs> these two examples reveal some creative solutions as well as setbacks to renovating the technology of American institutions. Whereas the Springfield Library presents itself as a slave to technological updates, the George Vincent Museum has allowed itself to adapt, adapt in a more integrative way using technology as a medium to educate in a contemporary manner. I theorize that the public institution can only evolve and reinsert itself into contemporary culture by following three linear transitions. These in turn will transition 19th century buildings into postmodern spaces, reevaluating re their relationships with materiality, humanity, and more recently, technology and virtual reality. So first and foremost, a public institution must be able to adapt to the fluid changes and updates of technology. Initially, the installation of what we would perceive as basic utilities, such as plumbing, electricity, air, con air conditioning, and so on, um, have determined the popularity and utilization of public buildings in the past. Uh, yet technology has predominantly now become this next basic utility. Whereas the Springfield Library has successfully adapted this necessity, it is only the initial step towards a total transition into postmodernity. The second transition occurs when the public space re-embraces its physicality, and thus becoming modern. Like my earlier mention of Greenberg's discussion of modern art, uh, the public institution must become autonomous and re-embrace re its site-specific site boundaries. Uh, space, unlike technology, is a multi-sensorial experience. One naturally moves, sees, hears, touches, and even smells within public space. In the midst of iPhones, virtual tours, and online databases, the institution must assert and optimize its basic function as a physical environment. The third and final step is that the institution must become postmodern, transgressing the boundaries of space and time by embracing technology. It must give up its isolation and use the advances in uh, the digital mediums to reintroduce society into the infrastructure of the building. Thus, like George Vincent, the, thus, the, thus, like the George Vincent Museum, the public space must work with technology to fully embrace and reclaim the multi-sensory experience of the interior. In the sense, technology is not the enemy. So this transition from modernity to postmodernity has so far resulted in a growing number of interacting, interactive learning environments that through the use of both public spaces and technology combined auditory, visual, and kinesthetic learning techniques to enhance public appeal. Multisensorial learning, multi learning experiences such as art installations, early childhood learning devices, gaming environments, and even military training um, present a progression towards a synthesized environment of both physical and technological space. One of this, uh, one, one example of this multimedia, is, is a multimedia, sorry, <laughs> one example of this multimedia collaboration will be presented this upcoming August uh, within the traveling exhibition entitled Van Gogh Alive. Visiting museum spaces, spaces international, Visiting Museum Spaces Internationally promises a multi-sensory experience dedicated to the life and work of this 19th century impressionist. 
featuring, featuring more than 3,000 projections of many of Van Gogh's most famous paintings, it will promote an interactive art experience, transporting you into the world of Van Gogh's images. The experience will allow for an integrated look into the bold colors and emotional honesty that Van, Gogh had, Van Gogh's paintings are known for. The use of high quality images and massive projection screens will enhance the materiality of Van Gogh's masterpieces, allowing the viewer a closer look at the artist's complex canvases and liberating one from the restrictions of close looking enforced within the traditional museum environment. So this provides a single example of how art and architecture uh, and technology can coexist within the public domain to create a new and exciting educational opportunity. However, to secure the future of the public domain, I would eventually hope for a complete synthesis between technology and the built environment. Despite the, the, how difficult this may seem, the beauty of adaptation is that every scenario holds a different solution and an exciting opportunity for creative exploration. These instances should, should, above all else, spark a further investigation into the synthesis of technology and educational practices in order to pursue a more dynamic approach to learning within the public domain. Whereas it might be quite some time before we see the total integration of virtual multi-sensorial devices within permanent environments, perhaps we are ready to pursue an American Renaissance 2.0 within our city's infrastructures. Thank you. History and History Modified with German. She currently serves as a curatorial intern at the Hood Museum of Art. Hello, thank you for having me here tonight. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. So, Dartmouth College's Hood Museum of Art, which opened in 1985, was established to bring together the college's large and diverse collections of art and material culture. In 1985, Peter Smith, who was the director of Dartmouth's Hopkins Center for the Arts, advocated for the creation of a museum, quote, devoted to the exhibition and contemplation of works of art to teach students the types of connoisseurship and visual discrimination which can make a crucial difference for artists and art historian alike as well as for the future patron, collector, critic, trustee, or curator. From its inception, the central mission of the Hood was to bring students into contact with art and to educate undergraduates outside the classroom and inside a museum. As museum practices changed over the years, the Hood has developed programs that aim to engage an increasingly diverse student body. This paper examines three exhibitions that used a variety of curatorial strategies to decenter authority and to challenge a Eurocentric, authoritative curatorial narrative. Fred Wilson's 2005 exhibition, So Much Trouble in the World, Believe It or Not, critiqued the college's history by foregrounding the collection's racial disparities and problematic objects. Native American Art at Dartmouth, highlights from the Hood Museum of Art, 2011-2012, brought in students who identified as Native American and offered them gallery space for videotaped interviews that played throughout the exhibition, which gave these students the chance to reclaim a contested, imperialized space. In Witness, Art and Civil Right in the 60s, 2014, community members wrote wall labels to accompany the pieces in the exhibition. Witness also provided two separate areas where museum visitors could, based on their own experiences, respond to a variety of questions pertinent to the exhibition's themes. These personal narratives were displayed as part of the exhibition proper. This paper uses practical examples to understand a theoretical shift in curatorial practice, proposing that there are many ways to decenter Understanding the history of Dartmouth College is vital to comprehending the particular challenges that the Hood faces regarding both its location and its collection. The, 
college was established in 1769 to, quote, educate Native Americans, but only about 20 Native students had graduated by 1970, and no women would graduate until 1976. The majority of alumni were white males who collected and donated objects of art history and anthropology to the library and the short-lived Dartmouth College Museum. The collections carry the racially defined and patriarchal history of the college. The hood situates itself as the repository of these historical artifacts, but also as the source for renewed dialogue. Dartmouth is a liberal arts college located in Hanover, New Hampshire. Because Hanover is in a rural area, students depend on college programming and student-run organizations for extracurricular activities. Most students first enter the hood with a class, whether to view an exhibition or to view objects behind the scenes in the Bernstein Study Storage Center, an area where professors and students can request to view objects that serve an academic project. For some students, a visit to the hood is the first time they'll enter a museum. For many, it is the first time they'll experience a teaching museum. The mission of the hood is to create an ideal learning environment that fosters transformative encounters with works of art. To empower students and make them feel comfortable approaching artworks, hood museum curators and staff have experimented with ways to move away from the authoritarian tone so often found in museums, whether in strict rules and regulations, price of admission, free, or in the curation itself. This paper focuses on curatorial choices that undermine the assumption that the curator knows and that the visitors must learn. These three exhibitions foreground outsider perspectives to enhance a visitor's learning experience. In the 2005 exhibition, So Much Trouble in the World, Believe It or Not, installation artist Fred Wilson constructed a meta-commentary on the college's adulation of its white male heroes. Wilson's show opened after two years of research, visits, and discussions with museum staff about the nature of the Hood's collections. The title recalls the freak show aspects of Robert Ripley's Believe It or Not, a cartoon feature first published in the early 20th century that highlighted extraordinary feats and persons. Ripley's enterprise expanded into a colossal media empire, spawning films, books, and museums. Barbara Thompson, the lead Hood curator of the exhibition, pointed out that Wilson's choice of Ripley's catchphrase was not, quote, whimsical. Ripley was given an honorary degree from Dartmouth in 1939, despite being a high school dropout. He donated over 100 oddities to Dartmouth's ethnographic collection, which were displayed in the Robert Ripley Room in Wilson Hall from 1940 to 1961. Wilson explained how his ethos of the Hood exhibition and his general curatorial practice connected with Ripley's enterprises, and I quote, I was really interested in the relationship between real museums and pseudo-museums like Ripley's a museum that presents modified and verified information, and a museum that is based on sensationalism, and the idea that to see something, you don't necessarily need to know the truth about it. Museums can tell you something about an object that may or may not be true. It is the idea that we are creating meaning for that thing. If you look back over time, often museums begin to look like Ripley's Believe It or Not. Although they may be using the best methods at that time, they may have biases and misinformation they are not aware of. Whereas Ripley claims the authority to display the freaks of the world, Wilson problematized museum structures and tropes. Breaking from the standard museum practices of spacing objects evenly, placing works on the wall at eye level, and distinguishing between high and low art, Wilson displayed disparate objects together and in ways that demanded that the visitor pay attention to curatorial choices. The exhibition opened with a collection of signs from Ripley's original shows. Hungover display case of arrowheads, labels, and a pair of socks worn by Daniel Webster, one of the college's great heroes and a celebrated 19th century intellectual and politician. From this point, viewers entered a room painted dark purple, where a row of life-cast life heads of ethnographic types from the 1904 Louisiana Purchase Exhibition confronted the viewer. With their ethnic labels concealed by silk scarves wrapped around the base of the busts, Wilson sought to reclaim the lost identities of these individuals. Only one bust had a name, that of Oda Benga, a quote, pygmy, purchased in 1904 to be displayed at the Louisiana Purchase Exhibition. Wilson sent Benga's bust against another wall to foreground that he was seen as an individual at that time. In the second gallery, Wilson demarcated another difference in portraiture, using Daniel Webster as a touchstone. Wilson spent a vast time trawling the collections of the college and realized that there were an astounding number of portraits of Webster, both paintings and sculptures. In this image, we see Wilson lying next to some of the portraits of Webster during the installation. In the gallery space, wall color demarcated the differences in representation. Red surrounded the 49 portraits of Webster, while 10 portraits of people of color from the Hood's collection hung on a white wall above. 
Wilson's segregation of these portraits highlighted the politics of representation. Viewed through the words of critical theorist Homi Baba, Wilson's exhibition made, quote, present in the display of art what is so often rendered unpresentable or left unrepresented, violence, trauma, dispossession. Because Wilson situated himself as an artist as an, and as an outsider, from the museum, from the college, and from the white intellectual experience, he created an exhibition that made visible these latent issues. Wilson's curatorial practice extended beyond the typical show and tell model, so often found in historical exhibitions, in which objects are considered worthy because of their relationship to historical events. Wilson questioned why these objects were considered important and worthy at all, and what historical circumstances do Daniel Webster's socks become more important for identity than a face, as seen in the ethnographic busts. Wilson consciously eschewed the creation of grand or even redemptive narrative, remarking, since the collection is as varied as it is deep, I feel a freedom to create a complex image devoid of answers. I hope instead it will open up a myriad of questions. Today we are about opening up questions, not being so sure of ourselves, not pretending we've got everything right. It's about staying open, knowing that something could change to push our culture forward, push intellectual inquiry forward, and also get closer to understanding other people's cultures. Wilson's well, so much trouble in the world, believe it or not, foregrounded curatorial practice and exhibition design, bringing together objects that created questions rather than formulated a narrative or proposed strategies to come to terms with the objects exhibited. Instead, Wilson challenged viewers by asking them to consider the often hidden patterns of violence in historical collections and critiquing the systems of authority that denied humanity to most of the world. With the exhibition Native American Art at Dartmouth, highlights from the Hood Museum of Art, the museum staff brought in a diversity of voices by engaging eight specialists in Native American art, three guest curators, students and alumni who were interviewed about their experiences with the collection. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So essentially there were a bunch of different video interviews of students. This is one. Um, his name is Jason Curley, and he's a Navajo Dine um, identifying Native American. And he made a rug, and one of his grandmother's rugs was also in the exhibition. And so they displayed it next to her rug, and he talked about his relationship with her. And this is um, Kayla Gebeck, who's a member of the class of 2012 and an Anishinaabe from Red Lake, Minnesota. And she was actually featured in a painting, which you see here. Um, and then there was a video display next to it, <coughs> excuse me, which you can see in the picture on the top, where she's talking about her form of art, which is dance. And she also makes these jingle dresses. And then she's also regaining her sort of experience you know, as a subject, she also gains a voice. And so in the last show, which was called Witness, Art and Civil Rights in the 60s, there were two different ways that visitors can contribute to this show. And so there were two seating areas within the galleries where visitors were invited to share their own comments about art on view. One area had three iPads where visitors were invited to contribute a six-word story to the race card project an online forum started by radio journalist Michelle Norris. Essentially, Norris was promoting her autobiography about her experiences as um, a mixed race person, and people kept accusing her of playing the race card, and essentially saying that she wasn't talking about real issues, she was just talking about race. So she started this online website where people could submit these six word stories. And so The Hood had iPads where people could you know, participate in this. <coughs> but then they also had these paper cards where visitors could answer these two questions. And these were actually a lot more interesting. A lot more people responded on the paper cards, and there was a lot of interaction between people in the paper cards. So here you can see that someone has recommended the new Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, and the person next to it has said, yes, you need to read this book. The other thing that was really interesting is on the paper cards, people shared stories that were a lot more perhaps personal or embarrassing, and maybe it was because they had more than six words, or maybe it was because it felt more anonymous, that people felt like they could really share very personal things. And then finally, the paper cards also allowed people to draw, which was a really interesting sort of other way that people could respond to the exhibition, as well as responding in non-English languages. So there were a lot of cards, for example, that had Mandarin Chinese on them, which wasn't possible with the iPads, which only had an English language keyboard. So, to conclude, we looked at three separate curatorial practices that attempted to dislodge an authoritative, centralized tone in an exhibition space. Decentering authority seems to be feasible in exhibitions that center around historical and contemporary questions of identity, 
typically situated around a non-white, white dye bowl. Here, it seems, museums feel as though visitors can and have the right to contribute personal narratives and to explore artworks through a lens of personal identity. But are these forms of audience engagement only valid for these types of shows? The Hood's curatorial ethos has developed over the past years, and more and more programs allow visitors to relate their personal experiences to the artwork. Even shows that seem unrelated have led to workshops and conversations relating to issues of identity. A recent exhibition on Poseidon led to facilitated discussions on gender roles and sexual orientation in the classical world and in contemporary society. The alternative, the alternative strategies described in this paper have worked to move away from the perpetuation of an authoritative voice. At an educational museum like The Hood, these practices are being foregrounded as strategies to intellectually engage students and to problematize an overarching curatorial narrative that no longer comforts in a postmodern fractured world. Thank you. Our next presenter is Allison Jeremiah. She is a recent graduate from Parsons, the New School for Design, in conjunction with the Smithsonian Cooper, the Cooper Hewitt Museum with an MA in the History of Decorative Arts and Design. Her major course of study has been in contemporary American jewelry. This passion for jewelry theory and making began at UMass Dartmouth, where she received a BFA in jewelry and metals and a BA in art history. Since then, she has worked at museums such as the RISD Museum, the MFA Boston, and the Museum of Arts and Design, among others. Most recently, she worked as a research assistant to Kirsten Swenson to complete the upcoming publication, Irrational Judgments, Eva Hess, Saul Lewitt, and the 60s. It will be available this fall through Yale University Press. As a maker and historian, Allison has been able to observe and pursue a course in jewelry that considers the maker, wearer, and museum object. Hi. Thank you. <laughs> um, so my presentation is called Consuming Contemporary Jewelry in the Museum. Uh, many of you may be familiar with traditional jewelry, the forms, and how you expect them to look. Uh, you may not be as familiar with the field of contemporary jewelry that looks beyond these traditional forms in order to investigate an object's relationship to the body. Uh, two points I want to discuss today are how traditional jewelry is consumed in the museum and the challenges presented by it, and two, the difference between the consumption of traditional jewelry in the museum and the conceptual sensory suspension created by contemporary jewelry. Well, that was supposed to go right there. Sorry. Okay, uh, we have learned to culturally understand traditional forms of jewelry. Rings are for your fingers, necklaces are for the bust, earrings for the ears, crowns for the head, etc. Uh, we have learned the placement of these forms, and they remain traditional ways of ornamenting the body. In the museum, these are most often shown under glass. The way that we consume them could represent ownership. The relationship to our bodies allows us to envision them. There's an expected way it should feel. We can see the scale, we can understand the materials, and from that, even derive an expected weight of a piece. It would be rare to see a small band of gold and have it weigh as much as a Cadillac. We can almost expect how smooth it would feel on the skin, and based on its placement, expect a certain weight placed on the body. We envision its tactility. More challenging to envision sometimes would be a form like a necklace. Where would it fall on our bodies if we were to wear it? Below the collarbone? Would it sit on our shoulders properly? Would a shirt hinder its movement, and would the weight be overbearing for everyday use? Museums have accounted for this in many ways with mannequins, busts, different representative plastic body parts, but more often than not, the way that traditional jewelry has been displayed has been in cases like a fancy store. This is somewhat effective because when we walk into Tiffany's, we can imagine the jewelry on our own bodies. After we imagine it on our own bodies, we ask the Tiffany staff to take it out of the case for us to try it on. We look in the mirror at ourselves and think about the weight of the work, how it feels, how the stones reflect on our skin, etc. 
When we look into a case of jewelry in a museum, the option to picture it on our own bodies is restrained because we, we cannot simply ask museum staff to try it on. The sensory restraint that we exercise in a museum has us look at the jewelry more passively rather than exercising touch, because touch in many ways signifies ownership. Oftentimes the museum will put these more challenging pieces on a mannequin so we can at least envision it on someone, even if it's not ourselves. When we envision it on someone else, we sacrifice the tactile imagination. We let the other person experience the material against their skin and the weight of the work. We let it catch on their shirt and carry it on their shoulders. We let the clasp catch in their hair and we don't think about the comfort or discomfort of it. It becomes a visual reciprocation between self and other. We become aware of someone else's body and the way that it's ornamented. We allow the other to express the work for us and substitute our own experience. We become passive to its tactility and actively recognize the interaction between the self and other. With contemporary jewelry, we are almost always the other instead of the active wearer. Many works cannot be simply understood by material tactility as they are often created by non-traditional materials. Plastic, steel, hollow casting, new alloys, uh, they are also often non-traditional forms. It may not be a ring or a necklace that we can culturally understand just by looking at the form. We cannot imagine the way that it's worn without being shown and placing it on the other. Many museums are accounting for this by showing photographs beside the work in order to understand their placement. But this may actually further us from the object more than a mannequin because our understanding comes from an entirely different media. The jewelry forms, when photographed, are meant to show them in context, how they are worn and whom they are worn by. Some displays have gone as far to include historical photographs of the original owner wearing the works, like in the Cooper Hewitt showing of Van Cleef and Arpels in 2011. The image, instead of the imagination, provides an answer for how a work is supposed to be worn, how it feels, shapes, covers, masks, and reveals. The object is then left in the wake of the images medium. As contemporary jewelry progresses into a more conceptual realm that recognizes photography as a method of display, Photography itself has become employed as the only form at all. The jewelry object itself becomes negated and the otherness is harnessed through photography and video installations. The jewelry non-object focuses on conveying concept and not conception. When looking at traditional jewelry in a case, we consume it much like we do at Tiffany's. The need for tactile possession to create physical authenticity is still intact. And more importantly, the need for the body, our bodies, is a part of our understanding. When confronted with contemporary jewelry that has no body, or even object, how do we understand it? Should we look at it in the same way? As jewelry becomes more conceptual and less object-based, it challenges our notions of display on ourselves and in a gallery as it, as it increasingly distances the self and other. Caroline Broadhead in the article A Part Apart from 2005 defines jewelry as objects that are active at the boundary of the body. Contemporary jewelry uses this concept of the body loosely in order to acknowledge our own biases. I want to very briefly discuss a famous example of the jewelry non-object that helped establish the redefinition of jewelry in the contemporary field, began to open the dialogue between jewelry's expected presence in the gallery and its veritable extension of the conceptual domain. Lauren Coleman's tongue gilding, a part of her hardware series, is a laminated print of a digital photograph and is displayed in galleries and museums as such. Coleman was trained as a jeweler and generally identifies herself as a jeweler or metalsmith. You may recognize her work from the Renwick's 40 under 40. Tongue gilding is 23 inches by 35 and does not adhere to human scale. The photograph depicts a crop body revealing a mouth, lips, tongue, teeth, chin, and neck. The tongue is altered by the presence of the gilding covering it entirely. The gilding invokes the bodily response of excess saliva, which can be seen coming off the tongue in a solid stream. The gilding is applied freely and wrinkles across the surface of the tongue. It does not reflect the traditional smoothness of gilding, but the title of the piece informs the viewer of the material. The gilding technique also does not speak to the time period or maker in its application. The gilding and saliva are the focal points of the photograph subject because they remain individual, unlike the anonymous body parts surrounding them. The interaction of the material with the body creates the salivation response and therefore this image. Coleman's tongue gilding was shown at Hopkins Hall at Ohio State University, which displayed her works in 2006 as a series of photographic prints hung on the wall unframed. Some of the material that was used to gild her tongue was salvaged, and the small gold flakes were placed into a jar. The jar was also available to see at the gallery, but the actual work itself is the photograph. The increased distance between the viewer of a photograph of a temporary work of jewelry is much greater than between an easily recognizable and culturally traditional piece. Coleman calls attention to the distance between active wearer and how we perceive the other as subject. 
She questions how her perception of jewelry interrupts what we see in a gallery, and the temporal qualities of her material contradict the permanence that we feel jewelry should strive for. The anonymous subject contributes to distancing between the self and the other because we cannot possibly wear the work ourselves. There is no consumption because the wealth of materials has literally withered away. Many contemporary, okay, good. Uh, many contemporary works today distance the self and other through new materiality and display. Makers question our expectations as viewers and use the gallery space to call attention to it. We no longer consume jewelry in the same way, and with that, need to question what jewelry itself actually means. Thank you. Lauren Sharp. She is a member of UMass Dartmouth's class of 2014, where she graduated summa cum laude with a BA in art history and a minor in marketing. While at UMass Dartmouth, she was president of the art history club and assisted with the organization of the annual undergraduate symposium. The, fall, the summer following her graduation, Sharp was selected for a competitive internship at the Rhode Island School of Design Museum, where she worked in the Contemporary Art Department. She's currently interning at the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem and plans to attend graduate school for museum or curatorial studies in the near future. Sorry about that. <laughs> what you see on the screen here is totally different from what's up there, and the two were not in sync for a moment there, but <laughs> now it's better. So I'd also like to start off by just thanking Betsy and the Artistry Club Department for having me here today. Um, having graduated last year, it's always nice to have an excuse to return and see plenty of familiar faces. So my presentation was cut down from a lot of research as well as personal experience, so if anybody is other, has any further questions or wants to talk about my work after the conference, feel free to let me know. In this presentation, I'm going to be discussing a relatively new art form known as time-based media, particularly in terms of the challenges faced by museums that collect and exhibit such works. To start off, what is time-based media? Broadly defined, the term time-based media can be applied to any work of art that is experienced over a set duration of time. This includes film, video, animation, computer and digital art, sound installation, and performance art, among countless other examples. These works are often defined by common characteristics such as temporality, intangibility, instability, and an occupation of space in a different type of way. I first became interested in this topic through the experience of interning at the Risty Museum in Providence last summer, where I managed a small yet historically significant time-based media collection consisting primarily of video and film works by seminal artists such as Linda Benglis, Richard Serra, and Bruce Allman. Through this internship, I saw and experienced firsthand the ways in which this unique medium is collected, managed, preserved, and interpreted by art museums. When placed at the museum setting, particularly amongst more traditional art objects, time-based media has an unparalleled ability to create an immersive environment, capturing viewers' attention and engaging their imaginations, while also causing one to stop and rethink a certain theme in a way that they ordinarily might not. According to Cyrus Manassa, author of The Problematic Video Art of the Museum, 
This interesting video art and new media began in 2000 upon encountering the said video monitors with an exhibition of Tate Modern in London. He noted how these monitors stuck out as incongruous and awkward in the gallery space, yet this particular work nonetheless engaged and fascinated him over many others within the exhibition. I have witnessed this very same phenomenon. During the time I was at the RISD Museum, a video titled Waltz of Machine Equestrians was on view in this Walter New Media Gallery. Unlike new media galleries within other museums, often a small secluded room set away from a larger exhibition hall, this space was situated so that visitors would have to pass through it in order to get from one side of the museum to the other. Almost unfailingly, nearly every visitor I observed walking through the gallery, whether young or old, alone or with a group, would pause to take in the video, often for the entire four-minute duration. I would regularly witness viewers staring at the screen in transcription, whispering excitedly to one another, and smiling by the end of the video. Although Waltz of the Machine Equestrians deals with certain serious themes, such as the destruction of Vietnam's natural landscape, the execution is subtle, lighthearted, and humorous, marking a drastic departure from the often somber and contemplative tones of the video art genre. Discussing the challenges of time-based media in art museums, it is first necessary to understand its, its historical context. Time-based media pieces, namely video art, began making their way into museums around the late 1960s. Around this time, a radical shift in the relationship be between the artist and the museum took place and exhibitions followed suit. Museums such as the MoMA became both a target and a stage for conceptual artists voicing their political and social concerns such as the Vietnam War, racism, and sexism, philosophies which are manifested in the video art movement of the 1960s and 70s. Exhibitions became increasingly filled with artwork that directed harsh criticism towards the conventions, practices, and, in the artist's view, limitations of the museum. Consequently, museums started to adopt a curatorial ethos that would allow its exhibitions to be shaped by ideological, historical, economic, and political issues and would limit the curator's function as an authoritative voice. An example that encapsulates this concept is the 1970 MoMA exhibition titled Information. This exhibition consisted of various installations created by young contemporary artists from throughout the world, including film, video, and interactive works, one of the first instances of time-based media in a mainstream art museum. Furthermore, many of the pieces in the show required some form of active visitor participation in order to be fully realized, marking a noteworthy turning point in contemporary art exhibition. One such piece, titled, titled Specta or Spectate, Spectator, by the Argentinian group Frontera, invited visitors to sit within a recording booth where they answered a series of questions on camera relating to power, sexuality, and everyday actions. These recordings were later played back on video monitors in the nearby section of the gallery, giving participants an opportunity to watch themselves live and reflect on their role in completing the piece. While the advent and expansion of time-based media have presented countless new opportunities for artists and museums, it also poses a distinct set of challenges. One of the biggest concerns and difficulties is how to preserve these works for the future, simply owing to the fact that technology is susceptible to failure and becomes rapidly outdated. For instance, many time-based media pieces utilize some form of videotape as their primary storage medium, yet videotape is not a viable storage solution for the long term. In proper storage conditions of about 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 50% relative humidity, videotapes can last roughly 30 years. However, if the humidity were to rise to 80%, this number is reduced to around 5 years. Migrating these works, or in other words, upgrading their technological equipment, can also present an issue. Problems may arise due to incompatible equipment, lack of synchronization, and, most importantly, generational loss, whereby each successive generation of time-based work brings back new issues in image quality. Common occurrences include image dropouts, distortions, shape changes, and an overall loss of contrast and sharpness. In 1999, the Guggenheim Museum in New York established the Variable Media Initiative considered to be the most ambitious and well-known approach to preserving time-based works and other non-traditional media. It aims to understand and explore the medium-independent attributes of an artwork. In other words, the ways in which a work might live on after its original medium becomes obsolete. The Variable Media Initiative proposes four key strategies for preservation. 
storage, emulation, migration, and reinterpretation. Each comes with a set of advantages and disadvantages, and the best strategy varies depending on the particular work. Storage, the most straightforward method, focuses on how to store a work physically, whether it be packing it in a crate or storing it on a disk. Emulation involves devising a way of imitating the original look of the piece by different means. This typically involves some sort of reconstruction or substitution of an artwork's components. A 2004 exhibition at the Guggenheim Museum in New York, titled Seeking Double, Emulation in Theory and in Practice, illustrated the pros and cons of the strategy. This exhibition juxtaposed original installations alongside their newer versions, allowing visitors to observe the nuances and judge for themselves whether the emulated versions captured the spirit of the originals. For some pieces, this was incredibly successful, whereas for others, it demonstrated why emulation may not always be an appropriate strategy, exemplifying the importance of carefully assessing the work's attributes before proceeding forward with any preservation strategy. As discussed earlier, migration involves upgrading an artwork's equipment and source material. The fourth and most radical preservation strategy, reinterpretation, entails reinterpreting the work with new materials each time it is created. For time-based work such as performance or installation, this may sometimes be the only possible approach. When considering these four strategies from the perspective of traditional media, the complexities of time-based media become even more apparent. Imagine working at an art museum and being required to recreate one of the paintings or sculptures in the collection from new materials while attempting to stay as faithful to the original as possible. This is essentially the challenge that time-based media curators and conservators are faced with. From an interpretive standpoint, the main difficulty of time-based media is that it is impossible to determine for how long or what part of a particular work will be witnessed by each viewer. Therefore, it is crucial to provide enough context so that visitors can walk away from a piece with an understanding of what it's about. I observed this dilemma firsthand while working with the RISD Museum's time-based media collection, in which I spent a portion of the internship writing interpretive summaries of about 100 to 150 words that will be potentially used for exhibition labels in the future. Having written, having written labels for traditional media in the past, I found that the usual challenges were amplified in terms of striking a balance between being accessible and informative, general yet specific, and writing in a tone that's neither too esoteric nor too colloquial. Additionally, the majority of the labels I wrote were for video work, which is not always the easiest medium to understand. Video work can range in length from just a few minutes to over an hour, and frequently consists of no dialogue or scene changes, and has little to no easily discernible narrative or plot. Certain video art pieces are structurally and thematically similar to experimental film, notably in their divergence from conventional cinematic narrative and technique and incorporation of controversial or abstract themes, although it is nonetheless important to note that video art is its own unique medium. In the video telephones, one of my personal video favorites from Brisbane's collection, Artist Christian Barclay appropriates a selection of short clips from well-known Hollywood films over a roughly half-century period and joins them together to create the narrative of a single telephone call from beginning to end. While conventional film editing would follow the sequence of one image to the next, revealing whom the conversation is with, Barclay subverts this technique by instead cutting to an actor from a different film, oftentimes a noticeable transition. For instance, Whoopi Goldberg appears to speak with Clark Gable. Through the visual media of film and video, Barclay reminds us that the telephone is an auditory instrument, which allows us to communicate without being seen or seeing to whom we are talking. A very different example, Linda Benlis's Enclosure, examines the dynamics between audiences and artists as related to the dynamics between media producers and consumers. Unlike the rapid scene changes in telephones, Enclosure is set entirely within the confined space of Benlis's studio, which is employed as a metaphor for the limited scope of vision of the camera. The video's narrative is simple and contains no dialogue or sound apart from the ambient noises that fill the room. It documents two muted television sets, a man reclining on a couch with a cat, and fleeting glimpses of children playing outdoors through an open window. These two contrasting examples, I hope, give you some insight into the extraordinary range of video art, in addition to showing how the medium's usage evolved from its early years in the 1970s up through the mid-1990s. 
In terms of the future of time-based media, I believe that this field will only continue to expand drastically as countless new forms of technology emerge every decade. Several years ago, I saw an installation at the court of the museum composed entirely of iPhones. Just as that exhibition would not have been possible 10 years ago without the innovation of the smartphone, video art was only just emerging 50 years ago. The future of technology will no doubt have a profound influence upon art production. Along these lines, I believe that museums will start to become more interdisciplinary in order to adapt new strategies for increasingly non-traditional media, and that projects dedicated exclusively to time-based media, such as the Variable Media Initiative, will increase. There is no panacea for dealing with this medium. Its complexity requires the expertise and ideas of as many individuals as possible. Curators and collection managers must understand how time-based media is conserved, just as conservatives should have some knowledge of its history and meaning. This type of collaboration is paramount in order to ensure the continued success of time-based media in the museum. Thank you. point of the conference, we're going to take a few questions from the audience. Um, my question is for Allison. Um, I, I, this is my first introduction to any type of contemporary jewelry, so I was interested in, you were talking about how it's an interaction on the surface of the body, and that it's sort of becoming less object-based, and rather just documents an experience, and that sort of reminded me of performance art, and that's sort of our connection to it in the same way that we have this distance from the object of the case and also a point in time. So specifically with Laura Coleman's work, what do you think about the performative element of sort of that? So, yes. Okay, great. Um, so Coleman actually had a few video installations that would accompany a lot of her photographic work, which I think um, you'd probably be very interested in. Uh, as far as the performance itself, most of her photographs were done in private. So it seems contradictory to the nature of jewelry in a lot of ways where it's for public display, it's for a social sort of element. Um, you know, it enhances your social self, so to speak. So you know, having these performances done in private, having only the photograph to show for it, I think is a little bit unlike performance art that's mostly performed in a gallery space for an audience. Um, I also you know, feel that she's sort of commenting on that and saying, you know, the photograph is as valid a material as, as gilding, as gold. So, sorry, does that answer your question? Okay. <laughs> interpretation of it is ob obviously very subjective and everyone has a different take on technology and uh, older forms of art. Um, so I, I actually don't know. It's it's an international exhibition. Um, I think it's starting in China and kind of moving around uh, Europe and Asia. Um, but definitely uh, look, look online about it and more of it. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure if it's going to be showing any actual artwork. Can everyone hear me? 
Yeah. Thank you so very much. Those four presentations were absolutely wonderful. And I hope you don't mind if I actually summarize and quote you back to my students in my classes, to Katie, my Art in the City class. We spent a lot of time on the public sphere and architecture. So thank you very much. And to the other three speakers, I'm also teaching a museum class on curation and museum issues. So this is wonderful what your presentations, how they enlighten me, very much so. Um, I have a specific question for Lauren. Uh, video art is so hard to teach. I also teach a new media class, and that is my biggest challenge, to teach video to students. Now, I saw the Vietnamese artist that you mentioned, and I too was immediately drawn and sat there and watched the video a few times, and then went through the um, museum and came back and watched it, and as did others. So my question is, how did RISD, or how does it work so well in the museum and is often so difficult to teach in the classroom? Do you have any suggestions? Thank you. <laughs> no pressure or anything. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, well, I personally did not specifically work on that piece by the Vietnamese artist. It was already all curated and lined up to ready to go by the time I got in there and went up a few weeks after I arrived, so I had nothing to do with that. I just observed it from a more subjective standpoint. And, and also, that's fine too, your observations are great. Right, and also kind of in terms of the work I did, I was able to gain a new appreciation for the way video art is something I'm interested. But if you'd be interested in learning more about how that piece was dealt with, I know who you can touch with, so we can talk afterwards. And you um, the others as well. Anything on video would be really helpful. Great. Well, um, within the museum, one of the things that struck me as interesting about video art is that it's able to kind of transcend this liminal position that museum visitors are opted in. On the one hand, the museum is a place of interaction and engagement and learning, but on the other hand, it functions as almost a temple and a sanctuary talk to you, be respectful and um, keep and quiet and keep at arm's length from the work both locally and figuratively. So um, and also just in the digital age when people are drawn to screens and it captures people's attention and gives them something to interact with. But then when you take the videos outside of that context it becomes very different because you're not seeing it how it would be exhibited in the museum space, you're just watching it on the screen, and the lack of kind of structure and narrative can sometimes be hard to wrap one's head around if they don't have much of a branding in that type of work. So, um, in terms of teaching video art, I would say to start out with pieces that are kind of entertaining and easy to understand, easy to follow, I think the Christian Rock Play Telephones is a great example because it's a very clever idea and it's very well done in terms of the way that it um, supports the notion of cinematic continuity and makes us more aware of how films are constructed and interpreted. Um, and then from there you can kind of, I would say, progress to more difficult and abstract themes like what the was would be a very good example your pieces are sometimes difficult to pay attention to and understand. So um, I hope that answers your question Thank sufficiently. You. Thank you very much. We have time for one more question. <laughs> so I just so I was just wondering along Daphne's line of questioning if you knew who was funding or supporting the Bigel exhibition or display. I, you know, I, I should have probably uh, really researched this a lot more. Uh, I kind of was using this specific uh, exhibition as okay. a very right. limited example. Um, <laughs> but I, you should just, you know, type in Van Gogh, Van Gogh, um, yeah, Van Gogh Alive, and uh, you can find out more about it there. This was, you know, this paper was very much centered on um, exploring architecture as opposed to um, the artists within the architectural space, so I understand that. Um, and so, yeah, if you, if you really want to learn more about it, I'd say go online. 
sorry. Thank you, guys. to know like how the administration of the Hoop Museum reacted to Fred Wilson's exhibit because it can kind of be seen as antagonistic towards their collection. So if you could just reflect on that.